We've been looking at the limit, which gave us a net area. And now we want to extend that to the notion of a definite integral and then look at some of its properties. So first of all, we'll start with a definition of that definite integral. So as I said, we're going to extend our net area limit. And just to remind you what that was, here it is. And I'll make it large so we can see what we're talking about. This was the limit as n goes to infinity of, and remember how we constructed this. We had the f of x k star, which gave us the height of individual rectangles, and then delta x, which was the common width of all the rectangles. Then we added them all up from k equals 1 to n, and that is what we took the limit of. Remember that in this net area example that we've been looking at, this was a continuous function. So that's a limitation on the kind of function it can be. Secondly, as I already mentioned, these were equal length subintervals, which means they're all the same length. The rectangles all have the same width, which is the reason we can take the limit and just let the number of rectangles go to infinity, because that will force each one of them to shrink, because they're all the same length. And as a result, we exhaust, as we had called it, we exhaust the net area. And so really, this is basically the same argument that Archimedes used in exhausting the area to find the area of individual figures. Now, let me remind you again what this is by showing you a picture. Because we want to extend this, we want to be absolutely clear on where we are right now. So previously, we had this situation. We had some sort of function here, but we did say that this f of x was continuous. So there are no breaks here. And we went between some points, say, a and b. And we chose to make all the intervals the same length in here, an equal partition. And I'll just draw a few of them here. Let's see if I can do 6. That's more or less equal, I hope. And then we sliced vertically with those. And then each one of those, we built a rectangle by picking a point in here to give us a height. Now, these don't all look quite right, but if you'll take it for granted that these are actually equal, then you'll see what I mean. And then we call this one x1. We call this point over here xn minus 1. Sometimes we call a x0 and b xn. And then the numbers increase. And then somewhere in here, we have a typical interval. So let's go ahead and look at one of those. We want to extend this, so let's be careful here. Let's say xk minus 1 to xk, typical interval. And this interval has length, which is the same as all the other lengths. It is, of course, xk, the upper, minus the lower. xk minus xk minus 1. Now, on the one hand, we decided these were all equal, so this should be 1 nth of the total distance here, which is b minus a. On the other hand, since that is the same for all of them, we gave it a single name. We called it delta x. So I'll just write the word same here to keep in mind that these are identical intervals. So this is a partition here of the interval from A to B. And the intervals are n equal subintervals. So that's what's unique about this. So what that means is when we let n go to infinity, that really means that we are taking delta x, which is the width of the individual rectangles, and letting that width go to 0. So that this will guarantee, so n going to infinity makes delta x go to 0, which guarantees each width shrinks. That's the important part here, that each width shrinks, so that this will eventually actually exhaust the actual area under the curve. Now let's take this notion and extend it. Not very much, but just enough to make it a little more general and something we'll eventually call the definite integral. So here's our picture again. Same sort of function, f of x, except notice I didn't say continuous this time. Our definition coming up will extend itself to continuous functions and beyond continuous functions. So here's a, here's b. Now, in here, instead of breaking this up into equal subintervals, let's say that we don't care about that. So perhaps we have some slices here that are very close. 
some that are further apart. They vary in different ways throughout. And at each, on each one of these slices, we can build a rectangle, depending on which point we choose down here to give us a height. So we might have some sort of picture like this. Now, when they're unequal, it is not enough to just let the number of them increase. Because what can happen here is that we could stop here and increase the number in here to infinity and leave all the rest of this alone. These would increase to infinity, meaning the total would increase to infinity, but the area would certainly not approach the area under the curve because this part would never change. So we need a better way. In the previous case, what really mattered was that the widths were getting smaller each time we got a new partition. We need to make that kind of thing happen here. So let's look at a typical interval again so we can get some notation. We have to be a little different here. There's xk minus 1 and xk. And of course, the difference, the distance between them, is xk minus xk minus 1. Except this time, it's not the same. So I will call it delta xk, where the k will be different for each different interval. And so let me just write here the word differ. So these will differ among themselves. And now what we have here, just like on the other page, we have a partition of the interval AB. But these are unequal subintervals. And there'll be n of them. We can still say there are n. Unequal subintervals. Now, what will we do to make sure that they all shrink uniformly? We can't just increase the number and have that force them all to shrink because of the reasoning I gave you here. So what we do is we look through all of these, all of these delta xk's, and we take the maximum of them. And we let this object go to 0. If at each stage the biggest one shrinks, then eventually they're all going to shrink. And if they all shrink, the area will be eventually be exhausted. So this, letting the maximum of the, x, of the delta xk's go to 0, will guarantee each width shrinks. And that's the key to our generalization here, in addition to the fact that we're not going to require that f be a continuous function. So letting the maximum of these go to 0 is what will make this exhaust the area. So we're ready for the definition. We'll do this in two parts. Part A, we'll say that a function f is integrable. That's supposed to remind you of integral. This is integrable on the interval a, b if the limit exists that looks almost the same as before. Instead of letting n go into infinity, however, we take the maximum of the delta xk's and let that go to 0. So this is new. In here, it will look very much the same. The height of each rectangle will still be f of xk star at some arbitrary point in the interval. The width will depend on which k you're at, so it will be delta xk. We will take the sum of them from k equals 1 to n. And this new limit with this new delta xk, if this limit exists, that is when we will say f is integrable. And this whole object by a is called, and you'll see this in the literature, this is called a Riemann sum after one of the mathematicians who developed it and much of the calculus you now know. Now, we have an and here. f is integrable if this limit exists. And this limit does not depend. This is the generalization part. Does not depend on the choice of partition. So any partition whatsoever, equal, unequal, doesn't matter. Or doesn't depend on that or the choice of the xk star points, which gave us the f of xk star, which were the height of the rectangles, you recall. So that's what it means for a function to be integrable. Now, we want to get past this in limit definition in the same way that we got past the limit definition for derivatives and develop symbolism and rules. We're moving toward that. Second part of the definition will give us a piece of symbolism. If f is integrable, as it was just defined, we write the following. We write this symbol, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, where just as notation, the b up here is called the upper limit of integration. You have lots of practice with this, the upper limit of integration. And again, it's not limit in the sense of 
limits as we were just taking. Uh, the limit is delta xk, the maximum of that goes to zero. It is in fact just an upper bound, but the word limit is traditional so we'll use it. And as you might expect, this one down here, the a, is called the lower limit of integration. This object here is what we write, and this is called the definite integral of the function f from a to b. And this is different from what we previous defi previously defined as the indefinite integral. The definite integral turns out to be a number. The indefinite integral was a function and had the indefiniteness of having that arbitrary constant c. The definite integral, on the other hand, is simply a number. And we'll explore this as we go on. One more thing I want to note here is that there is a notational plan that you may or may not have caught on to. If you recall, for derivatives, we had the delta going to the d. So delta x became dx, and so on. Here, we have the same sort of thing. We have a Greek letter, the sigma, which represents sum, becoming the long skinny s, which is what the integral sign is. So the, in the uh, Greek s becomes the English s, in the same way that the Greek delta became the English d. And now we'll go on and see some of the properties of this new object we just defined. Before we examine the full set of properties of the definite integral, let's look at a few things we already know in the case that the function is continuous. So this is about the definite integral of a continuous function, which we already know and have defined as the net area under a curve. Now what we will do here is simply state a theorem, and this theorem will confirm the following statement, which you probably expect is true. A continuous function on a closed interval like AB is integrable. Now this makes sense. After all, that's how we developed our initial net area and then extended it to functions that weren't continuous. So you expect this to be true. Let's write this down so that we can have it in our bag of tricks. If f is continuous, as I just said, on a closed interval a, b, then it is true and very easy to prove when we've already done all the hard work, f is integrable. On that same interval a b. And what we previously called net area, the net plus or minus area, that's one way to write it, between the graph of f, we'll just be very specific here, between the graph of f and a b equals the integral from a to b of f of x dx. That is the definite integral. Now we do often just say integral if we're looking at this and we know in context what we're talking about. But try and say definite integral now to distinguish it from indefinite integral. And this, indef this definite integral is definitely the net area. The theorem says so. Let's look at a couple of examples. We don't have any technique for doing definite integrals just yet. We're almost there. But we can do some definite integrals using geometry if they do represent net area then we ought to be able to use our knowledge of geometry to find at least some of them so that's what we'll look at here some definite integrals using geometry the first example will be this one the definite integral from minus one to two of x plus two dx now again we don't have a technique so let's think of this geometrically let's draw this function get a picture of it and Let's see what that will tell us. So we're going between minus 1 here and 2. The function is x plus 2, which is the 45 degree line shifted up by 2. So it's going to have a picture that looks something like this. It goes up to x plus 2 at 2 will go up to a height of 4. So that means this distance here has a total distance of 4. At this side, at minus 1, x plus 2 will go to a height of 1. So this height here will be 1. Now, what we want to do is find the net area. In this case, it really is the area, because the function is above the x-axis. And that means we want to find this area here, between the curve and the x-axis. 
Well, to use geometry, we can recognize that this is just a right triangle here and a rectangle on the bottom. So this integral becomes that right triangle, its area, plus the area of the rectangle on the bottom. And now we just look at the picture and find out what the dimensions are. The triangle has a base, let's see, for minus 1 to 2 is 3. And then the height, if we subtract 1 here, the height is 3. So this is going to have area 1 half, 3 times 3 for the triangle. Plus, the area of the rectangle is 1 by 3, so 1 times 3. That gives you a total of 15 halves. And you see the definite integral, as I said it would be, is a number. All right, that one used simple geometry. This one also uses simple geometry, but you have to recognize what to use. The definite integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, the first thing you need to do is from your past, recognize this. Recognize this as an upper semicircle. That is the upper semicircle of a circle with radius 1. So this is that function. So I don't need to do any hard work here, and I don't have any technique, so I really can't. But I can draw a picture and find what this integral is. This integral. This is the upper semicircle going from 0 to 1, so it's only the right-hand piece of that. Here's 0, here's 1. This also goes up to a height of 1. So I'm looking for this area here. And this is the function square root of 1 minus x squared, just as this function up here was x plus 2. And this, of course, is a quarter circle. So I just write 1 quarter, area of a circle, is pi times the radius, which is 1, squared. And so that's just pi over 4. So you're already able to do some integrals, provided you know the geometry involved and provided the functions are easily represented by simple geometric figures. Let me remind you once more of the notation. It's good to continue to focus on the notation so you understand what it means. We have this symbol, which means take the integral. We have this symbol, which really just tells you what the variable is that the integral is in. In here is where the integrand goes. That's the function you are integrating. And at the ends, we have a and b. And with this variable, you should remember that this is really x equals a and x equals b. They're not just letters. They're, in fact, the limits for the variable, the lower limit and the upper limit. So keep that in mind. And now we'll go ahead and get some properties so we can do more of these definite integrals. Now we want to learn how to find definite integrals. We'll do that in two parts. First, we'll look at what I'll call finding definite integrals, which will tell us some properties of how, of how they relate. And then we'll get to use the indefinite integral to help us find definite integrals. And that will be coming up soon. First of all, in finding definite integrals, we want to extend our notion of the definite integral a little bit in ways that seem clear, I hope. Here's the first extension. If a is in the domain of the function, so the function can act upon it, we will define the following. The integral from a to a, so these are the same number now, of the function f of x, assuming f is an integrable function, is by definition going to be 0. Now, why would that make sense? Well, if you think about it for a second, it makes sense geometrically. If this is the letter a, and we are asking what is the area above the single letter a, we're asking for the area of this little line segment. Of course, line segments don't have area. So to say that this has area 0, meaning the integral from a to a is 0, makes sense. Now, this second one can also be justified and will be justified in your class. But I'll try and give you a little bit of help here in understanding it. If f is integrable on a, b, we will define the following. If you want to do the integral from b to a of f of x dx, and you may notice that I've switched the letter ch order that we used before. In defining the definite integral, we went from a to b. So this is a switch of the order. Question is, how would that affect the definite integral? Luckily, all it does is put a minus sign out front. So the integral from b to a is the same as negative the integral from a to b. And the idea behind this is that if you're going from b to a, 
you're measuring along the partition in this direction, which means your lengths turn out to be negative numbers. So the delta x's that turn into the dx here turn out to be negative numbers, and that's where this negative number, this negative symbol out front comes from. But there's a better justification that will appear in your own class. So there's two things that are going to be helpful. How to switch the order and what that does to the integral. And if you have the same letter, no matter what the function is, you're going to get a zero definite integral. That turns out to be very handy. This theorem is very familiar. In fact, we've done this four times before. Let me just write out the properties here and see if you recognize it. Suppose you're taking the definite integral of a function f, which is integrable, times a constant c. Well, the constant comes out front. Also, if you're taking the definite integral of the sum of two functions, f of x plus g of x, assuming they're both integrable and the sum is integrable, then this is the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral of g of x dx from a to b. The sum breaks apart over the integrals, or the integral breaks apart over the sum, however you want to say it. And the same thing goes for the difference, the definite integral of f of x dx minus the definite integral of g of x dx. As I've said, we've seen this four times before. We saw it when we talked about limits, derivatives, sums, and indefinite integrals. So the patterns here, which represent what we call linearity, holds true for definite integrals also. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Here's another one that really is generated by a geometric observation. Suppose you have three numbers, a less than c less than b. So we have this sort of a picture. Here's a, here's c, and here's b. Now suppose we have a function up here. And we want to find the area under this curve. Notice that the area can be thought of as in two pieces, the left piece and the right piece. If you add up the two numbers that give you the two areas here, you should get the area under the curve from A to B. So the total area, this is geometrically obvious, should be the left area plus the right area. And it really wouldn't matter how many pieces you broke it into. As long as you can integrate under each one of them, you should be able to add them all up to get the total area. Well, this idea generates the following theorem, which is just a bit more general than what I said. If f is an integrable function, so f is integrable on any closed interval containing three points like this, a, B, and C, then here's what happens. Just as in this picture here, the integral from A to B of f of x dx is the integral from A to C of f of x dx, that would be in this picture the left piece, plus the integral from B, or rather from C, the middle part, to B of f of x dx, and that would be the right piece from C to B. Now here's the part that may seem a little odd. You'd have to actually look at the proof to believe this. If f is integrable on any closed interval containing a, b, and c, then the integral from a to b is what looks like the left part and the right part, but it turns out it doesn't matter what the order of a, b, and c are. I wrote it in this order to give you a geometric suggestion, but it turns out no matter how a, b, and c are ordered, this result will always hold. Now this allows you to break up integrals that are difficult by breaking them up often at a problem point. C would be the problem point here. And you'll see how this works out later. But that's a theorem we won't prove here. We'll just use it for work later. All right, here's another one. Suppose we have two integrable functions. So f and g are integrable on the same closed interval. Now here are two nice pieces. If f of x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in that interval a, b, then what happens? Well, if the function's always above the origin, above the x-axis, that means 
the definite integral really is area. So the integral of f of x dx is not only area, but of course is going to be greater than or equal to zero. What that means is this sort of a picture. If we have a picture like this and we compute this value, we will get a positive number, possibly zero, but a positive number. So if the function is greater than or equal to zero on the interval, then that makes the integral also greater than or equal to zero. And the second part of this is related. Instead of having zero down here, we could have just another function. If f of x were greater than or equal to another function's graph, g of x, again for all values of x in the interval a, b, then the integral of a, from a to b of f of x dx will be greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx. Now this is sometimes called uh, a theorem of domination, where f dominates g of x. That is to say, in a picture, and I'll put both of them above the x-axis, although they don't have to be, if you're between a and b here, you might have two functions that have a relationship like this, where f of x is the upper one and g of x is the lower. Well, it's geometrically obvious that the area under g of x is certainly less than the total area here under f of x. And that's all that this says. If this function f is everywhere above g of x, then the integrals follow suit. And this happens whether they're above or below the x-axis. So this is completely general. Let's pause for a moment and do an integral. We still don't have all the technique we'd like, but we have some. So let's use what we have. The integral from 0 to 1 of 5 minus 3 times 1 minus x squared under the square root. Now, again, we don't have a general technique, but we can break this apart using the properties we've just talked about and then see what we've got. If we break this apart as a difference, we have the integral from 0 to 1 of 5 dx minus, and then if I pull the constant out front, I have 3 times the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now we can go ahead and call upon our knowledge of geometry to finish this off. In this case, going from 0 to 1, we have a height of 5. So we have a simple rectangle. And we'll be able to find the area of that. Here, we have 3 times whatever this is. This, you may recall, is the area of an upper semicircle of radius 1. So we're talking about 0 to 1. Again, the same kind of thing we looked at before. Here's 1, here's 0. And this is the upper semicircle, so it's in fact just a quarter circle. So if I add these together, the, the area of this rectangle is 1 by 5. So 1 times 5 minus 3, there's the 3 coming down, times whatever this area is, which of course is 1 fourth pi times the radius squared, which is 1 squared. So this gives us 5 minus 3 pi over 4. And that turns out to be the value of this original definite integral up here. Now we will want to develop more techniques. But even when we develop them, the ideas of breaking things apart and pulling constants out will remain and will be very useful. When we talked about the definition of the definite integral, I did say that the functions involved need only be integrable in the sense that that limit exists and not necessarily continuous. So I want to give you here a note on discontinuous functions and how the definite integral can actually be interpreted and seems very natural. What we want to do is we want to be able to find the definite integral of f of x dx from a to b for situations like the following. Now here's a couple of examples. Here's one. Suppose we have a function that has a break in it, like that. So it goes from A to B here, but somewhere in the middle, it has a break. Now, this is a discontinuous function. If we were limited to continuous functions, we'd have to say that there's no integral here. But if we look at this just geometrically, it certainly looks like there's area here. This area and this area ought to add up to give us the area under the entire curve, even though the curve has a break in it. So we want to be able to find areas for this sort of thing. So we want to make sure that we see if this is an example of an integrable function, even though it's not continuous. So the set of integrable functions ought to be bigger than just the continuous functions. Now, we would like to, however, 
avoid these sorts of problems. Same kind of situation. Here's an A, here's a B. Here's a perfectly good piece of the function here. But maybe at this point here where the function becomes discontinuous, it doesn't just become discontinuous, but it becomes, it grows to infinity. So in this case, we might have some difficulty deciding what area is here because this piece goes off to infinity and in fact might be infinite. Well, that won't do. The definite integral is supposed to be a finite number. So we want to avoid something like this. So in order to avoid that and to keep the ones that seem reasonable, first we need a short definition and then we'll write a theorem that'll tell us what we need to know at this point. Definition. A function f defined on some interval i is what we call bounded. Bounded is the word being defined on i if some number m, which is greater than 0, exists with the following happening. The values of f of x are caught between minus big M and big M. Now, we sometimes refer to this big M as the bound. And it measures both in the positive and in the negative direction. So let me show you what I mean. Let me also say here for all x in i. And what I mean is this sort of a picture. Here is the axis system. Here is big M. Here is minus M, minus big M. Now, f of x is a y value, remember. So what this is doing is giving us an upper and a lower boundary so that if we have an interval in here, some i interval, and we have the function defined on this interval, there's f of x, if it is bounded by M, then it can't go any higher than m and can't go any lower than minus m. It might actually touch in both cases, but the point is it's bounded. And this will avoid the situation of a function that blows up to infinity as we saw before. Now, with this definition in mind, and this is a standard definition that you probably see elsewhere in mathematics, we can now write down this one theorem about functions that are not necessarily continuous. Suppose f is defined on a, b. Now see how weak a hypothesis that is? It just says it's defined. It doesn't say it's continuous. If that's true, then if f has finitely many, so we can only deal with finitely many of them, discontinuities. So finitely many discontinuities, places where the function breaks, in that interval a, b. But in spite of that, f is indeed bounded on that interval a, b. Then f is integrable there. f is integrable, which means its definite integral exists. So you can have as many discontinuities as you ha like, as long as there are only finitely many of them. Could be 1, could be 2, could be 10,000, but not infinitely many. And the function has to be bounded. Cannot go to infinity in above or below. Then the function will be integrable. The definite integral exists, and you can then calculate it. Here's another fact to keep in mind. If f is not bounded, then it's definitely not integrable. So you can immediately drop it out of consideration. If f is not bounded on AB, then f is not integrable on AB. So there is a little bit of information about functions which are not necessarily continuous. If they only have finitely many discontinuities, but they're bounded, you can take the definite integral. If they're not bounded, you will not be able to do that. There are other conditions one could add, but that's for a more advanced course. Some exercises. Let's look at these. First of all, to practice what little we know about how to do definite integrals, let's do some definite integrals using geometry. And I'll give you two here as your first problem. Part A will be this definite integral, the integral from 0 to pi of cosine x dx. And the second one will be the integral, the definite integral from 0 to 3, 
of the absolute value of x minus 2 dx. Give those a try. Now let's see how to think about these. The first one is the definite integral from 0 to pi of cosine x dx. Since we have no technique at this point, we'll think geometrically, which means in this case we'll draw the graph of the function. So let's see what we have here. Remembering the graph of the cosine function comes up here, has a hump at the origin, goes down like this. That would be at pi. This would be 0. The point in the middle, just for the record, is pi over 2, exactly halfway. And so we're being asked to find the net area, which is the result of adding these two geometric areas. And you notice that this one's positive and this one's negative, which means when they add together, you'll get some net area, which may not be positive. It could be negative, could be 0, or it could be positive. But in this case, since this is cosine x, and cosine x has symmetry, we know that the part above here and the part below here are identically the same, which means this is a positive number and this is the negative of that number. When you add the two together to get this definite integral, you get 0. And that's all there is to that. You're going to want to keep this in mind, because as you learn more and more techniques for doing integration, you're going to forget the easy ones. And this is a particularly easy one. If you recognize this function, then you can see that it is immediately 0 without any further work. All right, here is our second one, 0 to 3 of the absolute value of x minus 2 dx. Now, if you look at this, you say, well, this is the absolute value function shifted to the right by 2. That's what the minus 2 does. So if I have that in mind and I draw my picture, I have a picture something like this, where this is 2 units to the right which means it's going to strike up here at 2. And I'm taking the interval from 0 to 3, which is here. And what is the height here at 3? Well, at 3, this is 1. So this is a height of 1. And now I want the area, in this case it's actually area, the area given by this definite integral. And you can see it's the area of these two triangles. So it's this larger triangle this larger right triangle with dimensions 2 and 2 here, plus the smaller triangle with dimensions 1 and 1. So that's going to be 1 half the base times the height plus 1 half the base times the height, which when added together gives you 5 halves. I hope that's what you got after this. But keep in mind, we did this geometrically. Didn't have to use any advanced techniques, just geometry. All right, let's look at a second problem. Let's let the function be this one, a piecewise defined function. 2x for x less than or equal to 1, and the function is 2 for x greater than 1. And here is the definite integral to evaluate. The integral from 1 half to 5 of f of x dx. Go ahead and try that. Let's see how this one works out. We have this piecewise defined function, and we were asked to find the integral from 1 half to 5 of f of x dx. Well, the first thing I'm going to do, since the 1 half comes out of the x less than or equal to 1 part, and the 5 is greater than 1, that means I'm going to have to break this up into two pieces so I can use the different values of the function over those different intervals. So I will use what I know from the theorem, which is that I can break this up, by breaking it up anywhere I want in between 1 half and 5, and I will choose 1 because that's where the function breaks. And I'll go from 1 half to 1 of f of x dx, plus, and then I'll start at 1, go up to 5 of f of x dx. Now, since I am now on an interval 1 half to 1 where the function is always 2x, I can rewrite this as 1 half to 1 of 2x dx. Likewise here, since I'm always above 1, this is 1 to 5, the, in, the integral of the function 2. Now both of these reduce to geometry, which again is pretty much all we know at this point. So in this case, if I draw the graph, I have a line 2x, which has a slope of 2. We are going from 1 half to 1, so we're looking for this area. This is the function 2x here which means at 1, the function goes up to a height of 2. At 1 half, the function goes to a height of 1. So that will allow me to calculate this. And then this one 
is a function that goes from 1 to 5 at a height of 2. That's what the functional value is. And that is a rectangle. So in this case here, I will think of this as a large triangle minus the small uncovered triangle. That's the easiest way to think about it. So it's 1 half. The base here is 1 times 2 for the height of the large triangle minus 1 half. And then the base is 1 half. And the height here is 1 for the small triangle. Plus, let's see, this is 2 by 4. So 2 times 4. In the end, I get 35 fourths, which is what you should have gotten. And I hope you enjoyed doing this and saw how useful the geometry can be at this stage of our process.